So you wanna build a portfolio, but you don't have the money. In today's video, I'm gonna break down the five best ways you can build up a buy to let deposit. Number one and the most obvious is looking at your earning potential. Now this might seem really obvious, it's like, well I've got my job and that's that, but actually if you're looking to aggressively build this deposit up, you need to look at other ways. So first of all, within your job, I always think if you've got any sort of career prospects, you should be able to look at yourself and go, where can I add more value? Where can I develop my skill? Where can I get a quick win? If you're a salesperson, this is obviously a lot easier because a sale equals a commission. And so the more sales you make, the more money you make. But also if you went to your boss and said, hey, here's something I'm thinking of doing. If I did this in my spare time or whatever it was, and I could achieve this, what would that get me in return? And often those sort of ideas will bring up bonuses, commissions, increase in salaries, which obviously contributes over the medium to long term. But outside of your job, there's also a lot of money to be made as well. So for example, maybe you can trade some bits online. You can go down the local boot fair and sell it on eBay, which might seem like a really small way of making money, but people actually add thousands to their paycheck every single month by doing these side hustles. The other thing is looking at the active income streams that you can do within property um, to start building this up. And deal packaging is one of those that I'd heavily look at, which I'll touch on in a moment. Number two is looking at your spending habits. A lot of people always look at more when actually you can look at less on the opposite. So I talk to my mentees about this regularly when they're, you know, it's a bit cutthroat at the beginning where you're trying to get through, build a business, it's scrimping, it's scraping. If you looked at your expenses, you'd probably be quite shocked. And I'm not just talking about the thousand pound a year you spend down Costa or once I spent a thousand pound a month on takeaways, not a proud month, but you spend and spend and spend without actually looking at your habits. So try to make it a habit once a week, you know, spend half an hour just looking at your bank account, looking at your credit card, looking at your online shopping and going, where is my money actually going? I did this with a mentee recently who said there is absolutely nothing that he could cut out and it ended up being a thousand pounds a month. Within that, negotiate your prices, negotiate your contracts. So for example, your energy, your phone bill, everything you can think of that you're paying on a monthly basis, Audible, your gym membership, either cut it out completely. You know, if you're a member of David Lloyd's that's 120 quid a month, why not go to Anytime Fitness that's 20 quid a month, for example, it's not that big of a deal or you can actually negotiate directly and reduce your bills. You'll be shocked at how many people that would re renegotiate and reduce the monthly costings rather than lose you as a customer. Number three, fill up your ISA and other tax wrapper accounts. So you've got a 20,000 pound at the making of this video, 20,000 pound yearly allowance to put into an ISA. Now you might not have uh, 20,000 pound, you might have 4,000 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, whatever it is. But a lot of people, when they're saving up for a bulk purchase, like a property, they go, oh, I need to save 50,000 pounds. Let's assume it's 50,000. And then what they do is you save and save and save and save and save in a really shitty bank account that's getting no money in there whatsoever. The interest is 0. <laughs> Fuck all. And so you're not actually going to earn on your money. Now, hopefully you're not going to be keeping it there for long term. So it probably won't make that much difference. But personally, and this is not financial advice, I would put it in a stocks and shares ISA. So for me, I put it in Hargreaves and Lansdowne. And the first thing I do is get a um, lifetime ISA, which you can only put in 4,000 a year. And the reason I really like putting it in a lifetime stocks and shares ISA is you can put 4,000 pounds in and then the government gives you an extra thousand um, pounds. This isn't to do with property, it's completely separate. And that's a 25% bonus. Now, if you do take that out before you're 55, which let's assume you will, they'll take that thousand pound back 
Now, you might think, well, what's the point having it? Well, actually, you can earn money on that thousand pounds. So if you buy wisely, buy some decent stocks, maybe put it in the FTSE 100. Yes, there's an element of risk on there, but you're going to get a bigger return. Over the last 12 months on this, and the stocks have gone a bit crazy. I've made about 28 percent return on that portfolio. So it really does get that. And consider it's not my money in the first place, the extra gram. Pretty good. And then you could put the remaining 16,000 in there. Little wrappers like this, it makes a big difference. And when I'm saying a wrapper, by the way, it's called a tax wrapper. It means you don't pay any tax on there. The other one, of course, is a pension. So if you can get a SAS or a SIP, not for this video, they're types of pensions, and you pay into your pension, you can actually use them for property investment in some ways, again, not for this video, but ultimately you are deferring or completely deleting your tax liability, meaning that you can start making some money on your money and keep 100% of it ready for your buy to let deposit. Number four is reduce your cash input. And what I mean by this is there are ways to reduce your investment liability by either using government schemes. Let's say you're buying your own house. You can use a government help to buy scheme. So instead of paying in 10, 15, 20% deposit, instead you only pay a 5% deposit. And what happens with that, just so you know, is the bank puts up 95%. They're willing to have liability of 75%. You put in 5%, making it up to 80, and then the government guarantees the 20% in there, making up the full 100. But you can also do this with buy-to-lets. A majority of buy-to-let investments, you're going to end up putting in a 25% deposit. However, there are uh, lenders out there, um, for example, Shawbrook, Kent Reliance, that will actually allow you to leverage more. Now, they might allow you to do this based on your cash anyway in your situation if you've got a good credit history etc where they might actually go all the way up to 85 percent loan to value so you only need to put in 15 percent but another way that you can utilize this is with guarantors so if you've got a guarantor that's maybe got a portfolio they're an experienced landlord maybe they've got a good financial backing or financial history they can become your guarantor which puts puts them at a bit of risk if you screw up but again this reduces the uh, the risk to the lender and so they will increase the loan to value. Now, being blunt about it, I don't like doing that too much because I think leverage is really good. Over leverage can really sting you and, you know, when the market turns and it will, you know, it's, it ebbs and flows, there's booms and bursts. When that does happen, you don't want to get caught out being too over leveraged. So overall, I like keeping my portfolio at 75% loan to value or better, ideally getting closer and closer to that 50%. But, you know, have leverage, get yourself involved. And personally, if I were trying to get my first one, I would 100, if 100% loan to value were available, my personal opinion is I would take full advantage of that as a new buy to let investor, just to get me onto that ladder. Finally, number five, I mentioned this earlier, or touched on earlier, focus on active income streams. In property, people have this obsession with passive income. They said it'd be passive. And it's like, well, actually, passive income, does it exist? Yes, neither here or there. I guess it does. It's you have to work hard enough to not have to work hard. But people have got this obsession where oh, I need this and the property is going to pay me. I'm going to quit my job and travel the world. And it's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. In order to do that, you need a lot of property. Okay, I'm not talking like hundreds or anything, but you need double digits really for most people to quit their job reliably. So property doesn't make money. Money goes into property and then it makes money. So you need to understand that actually passive income, whilst it's great, gets you usually sub double digit returns. So let's say a 7% return reliably over the long term, which is great. That's an amazing return. But if you think, let's say you needed uh, £70,000 uh, to quit your job, that's a million pounds at 7%. Do you have a million pounds sat around? I, I doubt it because you're definitely not watching this particular video about getting your first deposit, right? So. Instead of focusing on passive income, 
People just need to get their hands dirty and focus on the active income. So that could be e-commerce, it could be drop shipping, or in property, the most common active income is deal packaging and property trading. Now, I am massively biased on this, but deal packaging works well for me. My deal packaging business did 100, just over 100,000 in January, which was really cool. And I guess you could say that was passive income because I was away in a Concagua, well, Argentina climbing a mountain, a Concagua. But obviously it took a lot of work to get there. So the active income streams, if I said, you know, with deal packaging, you can sort of do, I'd say between five and 10,000 pounds a month within that sort of first year, relatively simply, not easily. So if you focused on that and you grafted, let's say for two years, and you had a hundred thousand pound pot of cash to play with, that's ridiculous. The, you know, the active income creates the passive income. So I massively encourage, you know, I know a lot of trainers out there, a lot of gurus that sort of say, passive income, the life of your dreams, try a financial freedom. It's like, yes, but you have to work hard enough to not have to work hard. Obviously, I am biased on that. I run an education company teaching people about deal packaging. If you're interested in that, just put education in the comments and you can have a chat with one of my team. But I really do push it as hard as possible. Forget passive income, forget the dream, unless you've got money already. But sometimes you have to put in the effort and the grind. So earn the money, cut your expenses down as much as possible, go out there and work hard enough for your money so you don't have to work hard down the line. And I always say to my investors, you focus on working hard to earn your money and then get your money working hard for you. Now, obviously, I've just covered some basics there, but hopefully it gives you an overview and gets you thinking outside of the box that it's not just be patient and wait. No, don't be patient. All these people say good things happen to those that wait. Bollocks. Good things happen to those that take action and move towards their goals. So with that all said and done, let me know in the comments, what are your goals for 2022? What are you looking to achieve and what are you looking to do to achieve them? If you got value from this video, make sure to tap the like button. It really does help with the algorithm. And if you're new to the channel and you want to find out about property investing, make sure to hit the subscribe and the notification bell and I'll see you in the next video.